what we have to say. Now, when we look at the Belt and Road Initiative, this was launched in 2013, and really, the opportunities are absolutely endless. It's an incredible initiative that is actually in momentum, it's in progress, it's in process, but again, we probably need to give it a helping hand along the way. Opportunities endless without a doubt, but certainly challenges that do exist, and we will be definitely looking at that. And when we look at the geographical space, the roots, the diversity, the history, in fact, along this road, it's really an ancient route coming into our very, very modern society. So how do we adapt to that, and how do we actually make it happen? How do we harness the Silk Route for the Islamic economy? I'd like to welcome our colleagues now and get them up here on the stage. Joining us, the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Hamdan bin Mohammed Smart University, HBNSU, Professor Nabil Baidun. And he's in the house and he's joining us here. Thank you so much. We're, uh, he knows a lot about this topic. I'm going to be very happy to actually talk more with him on this. From the Dubai Islamic Bank, the group CEO joins us. Mr. Adnan Chilwan. Come on, guys. Oh, no. Nabil, over. Okay, we're, we're I think, um, Nabil, I need you. Swap seats, gentlemen. Exactly. We play musical chairs here. It's very much the Silk Road, what happens along the way. And coming to join us from China, from the Renmin University in China, the director of the Institute of International Affairs, Professor Wang Yiwei. So as you can see here, a diverse panel. We have two academics and a banker. Isn't that a great setup here? So, um, and again, we look at what's going on in the industry. And one thing I do want to remind you all of as well, is just what that silk route looks like. When we think of the Belt and Silk Road, many people assume it's probably one-way traffic. Some people are not quite sure how extensive it is, how big it is. Well, we're going to hopefully show a map to you, actually, and look at that. And actually, Nabil, if I could start with you, and we look at the diversity, we look at the size, we look at the routes, we look at the transportation, how goods can travel, how people can move. How exciting is this? This is huge. Talk to us a little bit about the tremendous economy that's out there when we just look in terms of the geographical space that it actually occupies. Professor Nabil, start us off. The, the Belt and Road was uh, initiated by the President uh, Xi in 2013 uh, to develop two trading routes. That's infrastructure project to develop two trading routes, one overland linking China, uh, Europe, uh, uh, the Middle East, uh, through Central Asia. And another one, a maritime route linking China, sun, Southeast Asia, and uh, Africa. Now, the, uh, the project is now an integral part of uh, the Chinese new economic plan, and it's a new role in the global um, uh, economy. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it opened the market for Chinese companies in, in a huge way. Uh, it uh, increased the trade between China and more than 65 countries, uh, representing 63% uh, of the world population and 10% of the world uh, uh, GDP. So in, in, in significance is a huge, in terms of investment, as we'll see later, is, is also very big. And it really brings China closer to the world, uh, and, and it, it really uh, also uh, uh, opens up the market, as I said, for Chinese product in, in a big way. We'll talk a lot more in in-depth on that. Professor Wang, if I can bring you in, and we look at this initiative launched in China. Um, and again, even as Nabil was saying here, all routes maybe leading to China and around China, tremendous trade opportunities here. How important is this huge new development for China? The Belt Road Initiative, now we call, is not just a one belt, one road, because many p countries confused. It's only one. Uh, it's uh, yes. based on the Asian Silk Road, but it's covered, uh, not just limited in the Euro-Asia continent, and uh, now extend to Africa, even uh, Latin America, 
I just come back from Latin at Brazil to also introduce the Bell Road Initiative. It's not that all roads lead to China. Uh, it's about mutual connectivity. So we need uh, more regional hubs, like Dubai always uh, connect uh, Africa, Europe, and uh, uh, Asia. So financially, politically, uh, even uh, uh, trade and all people-to-people -people exchange and facilities always. You know, we transfer the airflow from uh, Dubai and to Europe and then to uh, uh, Africa. So about mutual connectivity, this is a more horizontal uh, mutual connectivity. The traditional globalization is more vertical, so this is more efficient. And really encompasses so many countries, so many cultures. It's huge. And when you look at this, and then particularly looking at this from with your banker's hat on, we've, we've heard the theory. Now put it in practice, how does it actually work in theory here? The opportunities, the financial opportunities, the trade opportunities, they're gigantic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's uh, firstly an honor and truly a pleasure to be here. Uh, Etna, clearly I think uh, both our colleagues have mentioned the far uh, gigantic uh, opportunity that is there in the OBOR or the One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, to put things in context, right, everybody talks about the same thing, but to put things in context, we are talking about, uh, you know, 65% of the world's population yeah. is within that belt. Uh, and when you look at that 65% of the world's population and you convert it into GDP terms, you're talking about 40% of the world's GDP comes out of that region. Now, what is interesting is not just for Islamic uh, banks or Islamic finance, but for finance itself, uh, there is a lot of opportunity to kind of be within this uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, because it's not going to be uh, completed by just one country or one region or one continent. Uh, the sheer size of this is so large. Uh, in trillions and trillions of dollars, uh, no one government can single-handedly uh, uh, compete to complete the Belt and Road Initiative. So you require not just public funds, which is government funds, but also private partnerships. And that's where PPPs are going to be very, very important in order to fund this. Uh, it's just not about infrastructure, but it is about economic development that we are talking about here. When President Xi came with this idea, it was not all roads linked to China. Yes. It was all roads linked to each other. So I think that was the initiative that was intended uh, clearly to support and supplement trade routes. Uh, you know, back uh, in uh, centuries ago, we used to talk about the Silk Road. Uh, and I think this is just one feather out of that cap. Uh, uh, talking about one belt and one road initiative. So I think we are very optimistic about this. It's never going to be easy because there lies a lot of challenges in, in kind of implementing this, but I think it's a good start. It is, I think, a tremendous start. And uh, I think the excitement around it is it, it's just it's ongoing. And I think, again, when people really realize the opportunities, and even as we heard earlier today, too, when we look at the Islamic economy, I mean, we're looking at so many areas. But let's take a look maybe a bit in detail at some of these figures, Nabil, if you will, because we have six trade corridors. We have a lot of money moving around here. And again, it's all about those great trade opportunities. Talk to me a little bit, too, on this and how important it is and what people really need to do to maybe get on board as well, the magnitude of this. There's profits to be made. There's returns for everybody. Uh, uh, the, the, the economic uh, aspects of the project have been questioned uh, by, by many, and we'll get uh, uh, to that a bit later, but the, uh, uh, the, there are more than 100 countries, international organizations and agencies that have already committed to a road that cut across all of these countries. Uh, and uh, China has signed already uh, projects worth more than $900 billion uh, and uh, established uh, 75 economic zone in 35 countries. So work, work, work is underway. As this project gets uh, uh, further and in terms of scale and in terms of presence, more countries are going to be involved and more support is going to be uh, uh, there. The six corridors, some of them are active, some of them are semi-active, some of them remain uh, actually uh, facing some of the challenges that, 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 that we will talk about as well. But at the end of the day, the, uh, the significance is huge. The countries involved and the international organization, they are 
as I said, more than uh, uh, 100 driven by the Chinese government and state-owned enterprises. And come in here, Professor Wang. It's a lovely segue in there for you. When we look at the tremendous initiative that you know came from China and really the great spending that's happened there, how are you coordinating this and bringing in international partners, international colleagues to really bring this to reality? It's like Asian Silk Road. I said it's the uh, continental uh, globalization connected East and the West. And uh, Arabic, uh, you know, uh, transferred uh, the sorry, four uh, great in, uh, innovations to Europe and it then started uh, industrialization and it then started the great discovery, globalization began. But now we need more uh, driving forces uh, for inclusive globalization, not just the globalization benefit to the rich, some people. So that's the reason I think the Belgium Initiative was put forward five years ago in uh, Kazakhstan, the biggest uh, landlord country, and then one month later in uh, uh, Indonesia, also the biggest uh, populist uh, con uh, Muslim country in the world. So we are more pay more attention to the, uh, the relations with the Muslims and through the Muslims with the West. And then uh, you mentioned all about the uh, participations. Definitely, it's not China to finance this because of the huge demand of uh, infrastructure building and uh, trade finance. Uh, according to the American author, the Connect Graphy, the you know, human being in a common four decades, we will invest more than uh, infrastructure, more than the past 4,000 years uh, because of the Poor countries, they want to learn and share their experience with China to build, if we want to get rich, build the road. So who can build the road for you? The uh, capital is more driven for uh, profits, driven, and uh, uh, infrastructure building ba basically uh, should be long term. So it's more uh, state-owned enterprises that play a very important role at the beginning. Later, more private uh, companies and, uh, can join, and then to, to, to boom the uh, 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 trade, and then also uh, work together to finance these projects. And I think most importantly, uh, NGOs, uh, other companies, uh, think tanks, universities also participate because they also think about people to people exchange. And really it is about, it's, it's about bringing that sense of, I think, community, this vast community together. Now, obviously you talked about, um, if I can bring you in here, Adnan, when we were looking at you know, infrastructure, the trade routes and all that, but the Islamic economy, is, is huge, it, it's everything. And there was a wonderful animated video there, I think you saw it earlier, really looking at all of the elements and the billions of dollars that's to be made in all of this and the trade routes in, in everything. It's not just infrastructure, it's, I, I leave it with you, look at where you're gonna put all that investment. Where can actually people benefit from this? You know, having, uh, having put the Belt and Road Initiative in context, uh, we now move to how are we going to fund this initiative. We've spoken about uh, you know, public-private partnerships, we've spoken about government initiatives, uh, Professor Wang speaks about uh, NGOs, sovereign wealth funds, um, and when you talk about financing, uh, clearly I think there is an opportunity for Islamic financing around the world uh, to play a lead, uh, and I say that for a very simple reason. If you look at the 65 countries that are within the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, close to 30 countries are predominantly uh, countries with Muslim populations, right? So we are talking about countries within Far East Asia, countries within, uh, within uh, Central Asia, and countries within the Middle East that form a very integral part of the Belt and Road Initiatives. Um, just here, reminding our audience to just have some of these, the so, main Muslim so countries. So close to 27, 27 of the 65 countries are predominantly Muslim uh, uh, populated. Now, there is a linear tendency for uh, people within these countries to lean towards Islamic finance, right? Um, so, so that said, I think Islamic finance has the opportunity to contribute to the Belt and Road Initiative for a very simple reason that Islamic liquidity today, in today's day and age, does not find a proper channel for investment. So there is a dearth of liquidity uh, around the region. If you take Middle East or if you take uh, MENA region, there's a lot of liquidity that is finding the right channel. Belt and Road Initiative projects are predominantly infrastructure related. They are projects that are spurring economic development. So I feel that Islamic finance can really play a catalyst 
Uh, I had the opportunity of speaking at a conference in Shenzhen with, uh, with Professor Nabil uh, uh, last year, and I made the point that I think Islamic finance is that one catalyst that can actually bring public funds and private investors together into a public-private partnerships. Uh, some of these countries that are mentioned already have Islamic finance as, uh, as a key discipline. Some of these countries that are mentioned do not even have conventional finance uh, penetration. So I think finance in general and Islamic finance at first has a great opportunity to play a, a major role. Now, Nabil, just leading on from this too, where do you see Islamic finance really bridging the gap? Because there's a lot more money that needs to be clearly invested. And while there may be no time limit on it because we want this to be an ongoing project and we want it to grow, but how will it bridge the gap, so yeah. to speak? Let's, let's step back a little bit first in terms of who is currently funding uh, the Belt and Road. Uh, and there are three main banks that are driving the current investment. There is Silk and Road Funds uh, yes. with 40 billion. There is the uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank with 100 billion. And there is the New Development Bank with another 100. So we're talking about on, uh, 250 billion dollars that are currently injected. The Asia uh, Infrastructure Development Bank in one year uh, approved loan of about 1.3 billion dollars. So uh, uh, things are uh, uh, going on in terms of contribution from China. The Muslim world, uh, 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 in terms of relationship with China, it goes to thousands of years, you know, to the um, Han Dynasty uh, area during the Silk and Road uh, uh, Fund. Uh, and that uh, Silk and Road route uh, is actually part of the current uh, Belt and Road uh, uh, infrastructure project. Now, Islamic uh, uh, finance uh, brings in um, a, a system that is um, uh, asset-backed, that is um, uh, prohibits speculation, uh, uh, is built on the uh, risk-sharing aspects. So these uh, characteristics of Islamic finance um, are positive indicators uh, uh, for the uh, belt, be, 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 belt and Road. And we, the, the, the size that uh, uh, we're talking about that has been since the morning, the day before yesterday, in the launch of the report by Thomson Reuters, DNR Standards, and the department talk about uh, in excess of $2 trillion, uh, going to about $4 trillion in 2023. This amount of money is needed for the Belt and Road. Professor Wang, when we look again at the scope of this, obviously huge commitment from China. We have, as he said, three more banks involved there. But what's the next step initiative in terms of making sure that there's adequate finance to continue the momentum, continue the process? Islamic finance plays a very important role. It's not just the money from. Uh, I think the most important is the mentality. You know, global financial crisis, uh, the problem is too much rely on the uh, off-capital, back-capital, and the full-capital, uh, capital-driven mega-bubbles and uh, cause many problems. I think the, glo uh, the global finan uh, Islamic finance, they have a different mentality. Uh, like a traditional China, we're saving and, uh, and using this huge balance. And uh, I think it's more focus on the sustainable development, like the halal food is also green food. I think that's uh, the human being civilization is a, we need is a greater transformation. Otherwise, we more made crisis and uh, more populist and uh, extremist. That, that's that's uh, unacceptable. So I think uh, uh, Islam uh, civilization. We can learn a lot from 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 that. And most importantly, I think the people. Uh, why the uh, Belt Road Initiative pay high attention to the uh, Muslim countries because of the so far we, we have 1.6 billion uh, uh, Muslim uh, people and then growing very rapidly and then most of them are very uh, young, dynamic. So we need to. Uh, High technology, uh, IT and AI, or to, to, to find the jobs for them. Uh, so that's the reason I think uh, uh, so welcome. And then uh, I think we have a summit to focus on the uh, high technology in, uh, and uh, Islam uh, civilization and Belt Road Initiative. Talk to me, Adnan, in terms of how can, how can Dubai help? How can the UAE, in our position in this, and we're in a very strategic position when you look at the routes, we can. Just keep that up there, the way people can be reminded of exactly where all this activity is going to be happening, is happening. What, what can we do here in terms of leading this initiative? 
I think even before the initiate, initiative started in 2013, Dubai has played an active role already uh, yes. within within the trade routes with China. So, uh, you know, one of the most important partners for Dubai specifically, UAE as a whole, but Dubai specifically, uh, a trade partner is China. So, if you just look at in the first half of 2018 itself, we've clocked about 69 billion of trade volumes with uh, with, with China and, and the UAE. Um, and, and uh, you know, what a lot of people do not know is 65% of, uh, you know, exports that go out of uh, the UAE go into China. So I think from that perspective, uh, from where we are strategically located within the UAE, Dubai specifically, uh, being, a, being a, a geographical hub, being a logistical hub, uh, Dubai has made great strides already in supporting this initiative even before it started. Having said that, Formally, this initiative once it started in 2013. Today, if you look at DP World, which is which is the port yes, operator of within yes, yes. Uh, within Dubai, uh, has what we call a Belt and Road Dubai Station, uh, which talks about uh, logistical connectivity, warehousing, uh, and and they've done this tie up uh, between Dubai and the Zhenzheng uh, province within China. If you look at Abu Dhabi, for that matter, the Khalifa ports have a tie up with uh, with the province in China. So I think uh, clearly UAE is supporting this. And one should take a step back and understand whichever country supports the Belt and Road Initiative. Why are they doing that? In, in very simple uh, uh, you know, context, I think we keep talking about one belt, one road. But in my very humble opinion, it's nothing but globalization of civilization, right? Uh, so civilization and globalization is not just associated with the West. Uh, globalization today is through this initiative that has been uh, that has been initiated by Asia, China specifically, but in essence we are uh, kind of making the world a more smaller place by bringing in globalization. The Belt and Road Initiative, which started in 2013, has also uh, uh, gone one step further last year, and today we are talking about a Belt and Road Digitalization Initiative, right? So I think, uh, uh, you know, who in this world does not want globalization? You know, we keep talking um, about... I think, I think we could name a few. We keep talking about civil... <laughs> there, there's something missing from this map, but never mind. We'll, we'll carry on. Yeah, there are some countries that are not seen in those maps. <laughs> for, for political reasons, we'll stay away from them. But, uh, but clearly, this is globalization of, uh, yes. of, of civilization. And I think uh, Dubai specifically has a, has a great role to play, not just in the Belt and Road Initiative, but globalization in general. And that's exactly what it is doing. Today, uh, our relationship with China predates uh, even before the premier's visit. Uh, there are about a million Chinese visitors that, uh, that frequent the UAE. There are 4,000 Chinese companies that operate here, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with trade flows that I've spoken about. I think UAE has for many, many decades been playing a very active role, and I see that it will grow from strength to strength from here. Please, please, come in, Dr. Wang. Very interesting topic uh, about the globalization and civilization uh, relations. There are three uh, global uh, civilizations. Uh, I think the Muslim uh, civilization, yeah. Islamic civilization, and uh, Chinese civilization, the Christianity civilization. They have a global impact. Uh, the Chinese civilization is more focused on the relationship between men and men. Yes. And uh, the Western civilization is more focused on the man and the nature, very efficient, scientific, innovation, but cause many problems because uh, civil labors and, civil and, and then cause some light jobs. And the uh, uh, Islamic civilization is more focused on the relation between man and God. True. So in today's world, I think uh, we should, uh, three <laughs> global uh, civilizations work together to solve the problem between man, God, and the nature, to be more harmonious. Absolutely. So indeed, it's, it's you know, a very... Um, holistic approach that's needed as well. I mean, yes, of course it's trade, of course it's money, of course it's building um, a whole new community. But Nabil, talk to us also a little bit about, you know, the various corridors we, we see, um, because, because I'm actually fascinated by this as well. You know, we're looking at the China-Pakistan corridor, Eurasia, all of that. And again, the projects that are going on there that are really going to make this, it's making it a reality, basically. Right. The, 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 there are six uh, corridors. Uh, the amount of investment across the six corridor uh, is estimated by um, PricewaterhouseCooper uh, at $49 trillion between 2015 to 2030. Uh, that is not far from the Asia Development Bank uh, estimate of $8 billion up to 2020 only. Uh, and when we talk about 
Asia itself, excluding China, there is uh, a need of about $60 trillion, and Africa will need um, uh, $38 billion annually. So these are amount of money to be spent on earmarked projects across six corridors. The work in, uh, on the China-Pakistan uh, corridor is uh, underway, and it had, and this is the important thing for the Muslim world, it had an important impact on the growth of the economy. Leave the negatives aside, because they will always be uh, negative, but the positive aspects overall, the, uh, the, the impact on the economy was uh, in a place where they could hardly do uh, anything without China stepping in. The rest of the world was only talking about it. So uh, in, in, on, on Bangladesh, Myanmar, India corridor, this is semi-active uh, for uh, geopolitical uh, 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 reason. The other corridors are actually, some of them are uh, uh, working. So the, the, the projects are mainly in railway, uh, power stations, uh, seaports. Uh, these are infrastructure uh, 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 projects that facilitating the establishment or the development of these trade routes. Professor Wang, your president, um, you know, when, when he called about this, President Xi Jinping actually talked about the development among the countries to promote a new type of international relations, but also he called for building a green, healthy, intelligent, and peaceful uh, Silk Road. But let's focus a little bit on the green here, because you look at the scope here. And again, as you say, this is a tremendous opportunity when we look at climate uh, initiatives, when we look at the growth in demand for energy, really, how green can this whole route be? Yes, uh, as I said, the human civilization is uh, in a huge transformation, otherwise it's unsustainable. Uh, for energy, uh, more and more countries join globalization and uh, more and more people grown from the uh, poor country, uh, developing countries, so they need more energy. If the traditional way, then oil, gas, and then pollute so more CO2 emission. But now we, we should cut the CO2 emission and then provide energy. The only choice, I think, is uh, uh, we should solve this problem holistically, uh, uh, systematically, not just case by case. So that's the reason I think uh, there are three cases why there are so, uh, so many uh, energy demand. When I visited Nepal, uh, there also uh, lack of the energy, but a lot of water resources because of the Himalaya, mm -hmm. but no technology. So now we should help together to build the dams and then uh, provide that. And in South Africa, there are solar panels. And in Latin America, there are wind. So, uh, so this is the clean, clean technology. And the, in uh, Xinjiang, uh, we have the uh, sort of UHV connect with the uh, Central Asians, oil gas, turn into the electricity. And through the Xinjiang, and then send to South Asia. Because huge demand of the electricity, like Pakistan, you know, like Karachi, every year, because of the hot season without electricity, nearly 1,000 people have died of that. I, when I visited, so we are more, uh, more than that. So you have to wait. Clean economy, uh, clean energy. And in uh, Tunisia, I also visit uh, when the Huawei yeah. provided sort of smart grid. Smart. We got a smart grid because of many the efficiency of the using of the usage of the uh, electricity is very uh, uh, low. So we should uh, combine all this together and then provide energy, connect all this, and then so uh, re reduced of the CO2 emission. That's the reason President Xi visited the New York headquarters of the uh, United Nations put forward a global uh, energy intercommunication uh, network and then also had a cooperation organization located at the office located in Beijing. So solve this problem. I think uh, you can. Uh, access to the website to uh, how to do that. Yes, indeed. And again, in the investment side, and then when you look, obviously, tremendous opportunities in conventional energy, alternative energy. But let's take a look at all of the other businesses that can actually benefit, you know, from Islamic financing as well. Yes, infrastructure, all of that too. But, you know, this afternoon we're going to have an entrepreneur pitching competition. It's wonderful here. And to see a lot of the young people that are embracing the Islamic economy and really looking for new initiatives to actually, you know, the, the tremendous job opportunities are going to be caused um, here. The knock-on effect that's going to happen here, the ripple effect right around this region is absolutely huge. So from, you know, huge infrastructure projects you know, too small entrepreneur. Anything, I mean, anything goes when it comes to actually what can be funded here and what can work. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think when we're talking, talking about infrastructure projects, that's when you look at government, government funds, yes. sovereign wealth funds. 
but then the knock-on effect that, is ha that it has on the economy, I think it's just not about Islamic finance, but is Islamic economy as general that can benefit from this. And when we talk about Islamic economy, we are talking about, uh, you know, hospitality, we are talking about fashion, we are talking about, uh, about pharma, we are talking about many things that are underlying. Uh, Islamic finance is just a catalyst to try and, and support all the other key sectors. Um, clearly, I think uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has so much in it for everyone uh, that the private investment will find its way. And when that happens, uh, you know, you can elevate poverty because some of these countries yes, yes. that I'm talking about uh, are, are below the poverty line. Yes. Uh, so when you have an opportunity to be a part of those initiatives, uh, and, and the countries are there right up again, uh, when you are a part of these initiatives, you can bring uh, cost of uh, uh, goods down, you can elevate poverty, uh, you can uh, include uh, financial inclusion, you know, so all of those initiatives uh, emanate out of, uh, of, out of the Belt and Road Initiative. So I think the name a Belt and Road Initiative might just uh, kind of deter people by thinking that it's a road that is, being, uh, that is being built to connect everyone, which is the case, roads and ports and infrastructure. But I think we are globalizing economies over here. I think one should understand the impact that this initiative can have on the global economy. We are talking about trillions and trillions of dollars in GDP, but the global economy has a lot to gain. Islamic economy has a lot to gain because these are one-third predominantly Islamic economies. Mm. Professor Wang, when we look at particularly the countries here, some of them are not the best friends, some of these countries, and they have different traditions, different political systems. There's a lot of geopolitics when we look at that wider picture too. So there are, you know, while we look at the harmonious, you know, sort of promise that this will bring, we really have to look at the reality right now, and there are still a lot of challenges. Firstly, the Belarus Initiative now is being the global, you know, not just limited in those countries. Uh, the one, more than 150 countries and international organizations signed in the MOU with China at the jointly built Belarus Initiative, and many international organizations, inclu including United Nations, echo the. Uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the resolutions of the Belarus Initiative. Because of the, Bel the Belarus Initiative, the goal is to achieve the community of the shared future for humankind. So I'm very glad that you know, we have the theme of the shared future. So that's the, that's the transformation of, the, uh, as I said, the human civilization. It's not the traditional one, your future is at the cost of others' future. It's not a zero sum game. It's not a winners take all. I think that's kind of that. So more and more countries participate and then uh, echo that uh, the uh, transformation of the civilization. And then the risks. Uh, the Chinese thinking of a way is opportunities and the risks come together. So in Chinese we say, Wei Ji crisis means opportunities and, cr opt and crisis. So in English, only crisis. So <laughs> many problems, in, even if you see this con uh, those countries, right? And, uh, but Belt and Road is more a geo economy, it's not a geopolitics. So mutual connectivity is, to, is I think, is a key to solve this problem because it's a focus on the real economy. As I said, not a mega bubble. It's a focus more on the mutually connected. It is not hierarchically being globalized. So according to the McKinsey, uh, they have the report also predict that by 2050, the Belt Road Initiative will contribute 80% of the economic growth for the world. We will bring a 3 billion new middle class for the world. Because the traditional globalization is more uh, tax, uh, the, the tax reduction. Yes, yes. It's a maximum contribute to the world economic growth for 5%. Because it's horizontal, mutually connected, so they contrib contribute to the world economic growth for more than 10 to 15 percent, and the loss of the jobs and loss of the opportunities can come from those countries. And again, now, and then I know your bank has business in Indonesia, Pakistan, many of these countries, but they must also present perhaps a few headaches every now and then in terms of regulations, tax, just access, ease of access of doing business as well there are still challenges we need to be looking at and maybe addressing very, very quickly too. Oh, of course, there are no free lunches in this world, right? So uh, uh, clearly, I think every region, every country has its own challenges, yes. uh, which, which also can be looked at as an opportunity. Um, you know, I think one must not forget that any opportunity starts with an intention and the intention 
uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative is, is the thing that really connects everything together. Right. When you have intention, you know, you can, uh, you can conquer worlds, right? So I think from that perspective, um, uh, you know, uh, whilst we operate and we have different jurisdictions regulating us, uh, you know, that does not deter us from participating in more and more countries. And it does not deter, uh, you know, all these uh, 65 countries to join hands. So I think, uh, um, you know, the most unprofitable item ever manufactured in this world is an excuse. Uh, so I think if we start looking <laughs> at excuses... And there's a lot of them around. <laughs> uh, if we start looking at excuses, we'll find so many. Uh, so yes, there are challenges. Uh, there are geopolitical challenges. There are connectivity challenges. There are challenges about uh, legal framework, regulations. Uh, but listen, if, uh, if there were no challenges, then the world would be a different place. And that's what makes it even more interesting. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the intention of President Z uh, needs to be commended. Uh, it needs to be supported. It needs to be applauded. And I think that's what all of these countries in bits and pieces have started doing that. UAE, I must say, plays an active role in supporting that initiative. And, uh, you know, wherever we and our financial institution can add value, we will. Uh, we are a part of so many of these countries on, on the map today. So I think uh, we support uh, uh, globalization of civilization. Yes. Um, talk to me, um, Nabil, too, on this too. The challenge of the challenges, so to speak, here. Um, again, when you look around the world here, and particularly, obviously, at this region right, right now, um, and it's, it's not yet as harmonious as we want to be. The intention definitely there, people buying into it, people mm -hmm. making it happen. But still, you know, there's still, uh, the challenges are, they're surmountable, I would hope, but, but they're big. Yeah. As you can see, it's not difficult to make the case for Islamic finance or the Islamic countries, those Islamic countries to play a role in the Belt and Road. There is a need, there is a gap, there is a funding gap, there is money there. It's very easy to make the case for Islamic uh, finance. But for Islamic finance to realize its role, there are several challenges on both sides. One, uh, when it comes to Islamic finance, the understanding that Islamic finance is for, the, for Muslims, okay, is everywhere. When we went to China, and we've been going there every year to, to, to change that view, uh, Islamic finance, for uh, non-Muslim as much as it is for uh, uh, Muslims. Uh, then uh, the, uh, on, on the Islamic finance uh, institution and the provider side, they need to provide uh, products that are, um, uh, that reflect the unique circumstances of the Belt and Road and of the decision-making process along that road for, uh, in terms of uh, funding. But on the other side, from uh, the, the, the China and the uh, countries along the Belt and Road, uh, China uh, or Islamic finance is not at par, is, is, is actually disadvantaged. For example, uh, Islamic uh, uh, sukuk or Islamic bonds are not uh, uh, treated equally when it comes to tax uh, uh, in, in many of these uh, yes. uh, countries. So they need to be put on uh, equal uh, footing. They need to be allowed to be traded uh, uh, there. So these uh, challenges need to be addressed and looked at as opportunities in my view. But one final thing, at the end of the day, people have a choice, Etna. Yes. One uh, is, 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 is basically uh, uh, financial institutions in this part of the world can look at the Belt and Road and can wait and see uh, uh, because of the economics domain make sense because the regulations are there, or let's uh, try to play an, uh, an active role and, and be part of it, uh, make sure the numbers uh, uh, are correct, but be an active part, not a reactive uh, partner to the Belt and Road, because the Belt and Road is there to stay. It's there to stay. I'm going to, to wrap this up now and ask all of you just for a few closing words, and particularly, um, Professor Wang, what do you think can be done you know, in the short term, to really push this forward and to really help make it a reality? Uh, like the successful of the Chinese open reform, I think it's, uh, we learn from the Western the market economy, but localized, channelized. The Belt Road Initiative, even initiated by the Chinese government, but it need more localized by so many countries, not just the central government level, but the local and even uh, uh, okay. grassroots level. I think that's the, basically uh, the future of that. Nabil, what do you think really needs to be done here to move uh, this I, forward? I, I think we, uh, th there are various players. Each will need to play a part, the Islamic financial institution, universities, 
and the regulators in China need to open the door for uh, uh, Islamic finance because it has a great opportunity. Us as a university need to play a role in China. Islamic banks like uh, uh, Dubai Islamic Bank and the rest need to really play a more active role in, in, in that. And Adnan, I'm leaving this to you. As I said, two academics and a banker. So we're leaving the man with the money, the final word here. Um, looking at, because it's, it's, you know, it's going to be about the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And as much as we want that holistic development and there's the tremendous international relations that will happen and there's, the, the benefits are huge on this. But ultimately, it's going to be about the money and it's going to be about the success of business here. So I'm leaving you the closing word. What needs to be done now and what needs to be done to actually put a bit more momentum into this initiative. I think Aitna, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it's much more than money. Uh, first of all, we need to activate all the inactive corridors. Right. Uh, the most active corridors are within, uh, you know, Southeast Asia and South Asia. Uh, for example, the China-Pakistan economic corridor is very active. Uh, so is the corridor that uh, between you know China and some of the uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, but we've not seen a lot of corridors active in Africa, uh, you know. And everybody keeps talking about the promise of Africa, Africa rising. I think if we build a corridor and activate the African corridor, uh, I would see that uh, you know this would really uh, catch fire pretty yes. quickly. Um, you know, financial institutions have an active role to play. Uh, clearly, there is a lot of commercial aspects that need to be looked into. Uh, but uh, like I said, one should not just keep talking about you know, geopolitical issues or talking about regulatory and legal framework. Uh, if you want excuses, we can, we can have many. Uh, on a parting note, I would like to say that you know, hindsight is always a luxury. So I think two decades from today, when we look back, we'll be talking about, oh, we, we missed that opportunity. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for banks, specifically Islamic banks, and in general, the Islamic economy, uh, to make the most of uh, these corridors, uh, because they cut across all spectrums of life, all sectors that yes. you can think of. It's just not roads, ports, airports, and bridges, but it's much more ingrained within the vibrancy of the economy. We are talking about sectors such as healthcare, education, logistics, uh, uh, retail. All these sectors are an inherent part of that one belt, one road initiative. So I think uh, uh, when financial institutions want to participate, they should just not look at infrastructure related projects, but they should also support financial inclusiveness, they should support entrepreneurs, they should support uh, small and medium enterprises, because all of this is a crux of what the belt, one belt, one road initiative is. To me, it is nothing but globalization of civilization. Super, on that very optimistic and a very powerful note there. So it is time to take action. The opportunities are huge. They're there, they're happening. And as you say, you don't want to be looking back 20 years from now saying, you know, we could have, we should have. Um, and it really is tremendous opportunities there. I think once again, I, I love that map. Thank you, Nabil, for getting that one for me, putting it together there and really looking at the scope of all of these uh, pathways, all of these initiatives that each and every one of us can actually play a part in. So I really want to thank my panel. Um, you've been wonderful to be here with me. Professor Wang, thank you so much. Adnan, thank you. And Nabil, thank you so much for taking Pleasure. the time and for sharing your great experience and your background with us. Thank, thank you. And your advice. So thank you so much. And of course, my dear audience, thank you for staying with us. Um, I think Maya is coming back to the stage and um, we'll leave it with her to uh, bring you up to date with our next plan of action. Thank you, thank you, Etna, thank you, thank your you. guests. So ladies and gentlemen, we will now have our lunch break. Please return back to the main hall at 2 p.m. for the inaugural Islamic Creative Economy Competition. See you all then.